a friend was dreading a letter from the IRS. So according to their early calculations, he owed them money. Money he didn't have. And so they informed him that a letter would be coming detailing how much money he owed them, and he was dreading that letter. When the letter finally arrived, his courage failed him, and he could not bear to open that letter. And so that letter stayed there sitting on his desk for five days while he was just groaning in fear. How much am I going to owe? How much is that bill going to be? Where am I going to get the funds to pay for that? How long am I going to be in prison for this? Finally, he got the courage to open the letter. And he found, to his surprise, not a bill to be paid, but a check to be cashed. The IRS, it, as, it, as it turns out, owed him money. But he had wasted five days in needless, pointless fear. Fear that wouldn't have had to be there if he would have just opened the letter and read it. Do we do the same thing? I mean, do we spend a lot of time cowering in fear because we haven't opened the letter? Do, do we spend a lot of time cowering in fear because of things that we wouldn't need to be afraid of? You know, maybe fear of failing in public, fear of unemployment, fear of heights, maybe fear of um, never being able to find the right spouse, or fear of never having being able to enjoy good health, or fear of growing senile one day, or fear of not being able to provide for your family one day, even though you are now, or fear of being trapped, or being abandoned, or being lost, or being forgotten. We could keep going. And all of these things might be legitimate concerns, but you get the point, right? If, you, if we just start fearing about something that might happen, if, if these things can become monsters, overpowering us, monsters causing us to fear if we never open the letter. When a challenge comes your way, when a challenge comes in front of you, is your first thought about what you can do to overcome the challenge? About what you can do to, to fix it? How many, how many sources for help do you turn to when that challenge comes before finally turning to God? Do, do we sometimes have a list of things or people or uh, sources of help that we turn to before turning to God? Do, do you sometimes have trouble, have difficulty trusting that God has the power to do what he's promised? Because that is what being afraid is. Not trusting That God has the power to do what he's promised. Faith is trusting that God has the power to do what he's promised. Being afraid is not trusting that God has the power to do what he's promised. So being afraid is the opposite of faith. Being afraid means that that we don't quite or don't at all or whatever, don't, that we don't fully trust that God has the power to do what he has promised. We see it in the world, for sure, and we see it in our own lives. And today we also see it in a king named Ahaz and the people of Judah. Ahaz lived, um, Ahaz was a king, one of the kings of Judah, 700 years before Jesus was born. Now, he had a God-fearing father. Okay, he was born in a God-fearing home. God-fearing, even a more God-fearing grandfather. But, but for some reason, he, it seems that he didn't open the book that they had been reading out of. And so he lived afraid. He lived in fear because he didn't trust that God had the power to do what he promised. And so since he was afraid, in fear, he then started turning to other gods to give what he needed. But since he didn't find what he's looking for there, he was still living in fear. And in fear, then he even, he sacrificed his own son to those gods to try to make things better. And that didn't work. So still in fear, he encouraged others 
he encouraged his people to do the same thing. That's what his life was like. And so what happened here, what happened historically is that two kings ganged up now against him to overpower him. And it says that the hearts of Ahaz and the people of Judah were shaking like trees in a wind. <laughs> they, were, they were afraid. And so instead of opening the letter, instead of asking God for help, he went and actually asked another enemy nation, Assyria, for help against these other two enemies. And so even though he didn't deserve it, God wanted him to know that he was going to be safe. So we saw it in the video a little bit. So the Lord sent his prophet Isaiah and his son, and Isaiah's son, to go and meet Ahaz. Now remember, Ahaz had sacrificed his own son. And here God sends, a, this is very unusual, God sends the prophet Isaiah and Isaiah's son to meet him, to meet the guy who had sacrificed his own son, his son being there, almost a way of God saying, listen, our God doesn't demand your sons. Our God promises hope through sons. And Isaiah's, so Isaiah's son was there as a symbol of, of hope. And his name, Shir Jashub, meant a remnant will return. So th that would have told Ahaz, th just the, the boy's name, the son's name would have told Ahaz that everything's going to turn out all right in the end. That, that yes, they're going to go through some difficulty, but they're not going to be utterly destroyed. And everything's going to be all right in the end. And the heart of their message that Isaiah and his son bring is right there. Be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. That's the message. So don't seek aid from Assyria. Okay? Don't panic. I am here. I am here to help you. I am here to rescue you. You don't have to be afraid. Don't, don't lose heart because of these two little kings. And God almost uses sarcasm to kind of show how inept these other two kings are and, and how short-lived they're, they're He's like, don't, don't lose heart because of these two little kings that seem so big to you. All right? They're making all these big threats, but they are nothing. It ain't going to happen. All right? They're not going to be a threat to you. Just don't go looking for help from the other big guy. Don't go looking help from the world and the other sources. Okay? I'm here to help you. And I want you to know that you can trust in me. And, and God says this, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand firm at all. So I want to give you a sign so that you don't have to be afraid. So then he says, ask the Lord for a sign, any sign at all. In the deepest depths, if you want me to bring someone up from the dead, in the highest heights, if you want me to bring someone from heaven, ask for any sign at all. Because you don't believe Isaiah's words, so I want to show you. I want to do something. I want to give you a sign that will just help you trust me. And Ahaz says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. That wasn't the reason. The Lord just told him to ask for a sign. That wasn't the reason at all. And I don't even think this was mock humility. Why would he have said, I'm not going to ask for a sign? Here's why I think. You think Ahaz was maybe too afraid that if he asked God for help, he would have to do it God's way instead of his own way. Do you think maybe that Ahaz was too afraid that if he asked God for help, that would mean that he'd have to do things God's way and not the way that he was accustomed to doing it his own. As we, as we give him our time, do we trust God as we give him our offerings? God has given us this amazing, powerful sign in the word and the sacrament. Do we turn to it to be strengthened? Or do we end up believing the lie that the enemy is constantly, constantly attacking us with? The lie that God isn't real. God isn't able to help. God doesn't want to help. You want to just think that one through backwards and see what it sounds like? Well, God must not want to help me. So maybe God isn't able to help me. So maybe God isn't real. 
You see how the enemy uses that lie? You see how the world around us gives us things to fear to send us there? It's what Ahaz was struggling with. It's what we've struggled with. It's what the world around us has struggled with. That's the lie the enemy wants us to believe. So God says, God says that he has, you don't want a sign? Then I'm going to give you one anyway. I'm going to do it anyway because I'm God. But it's, it's, it's really cool here what he says. Because he's talking to Ahaz, you don't want a sign? Then I'm going to give you a sign. You there is plural. Not talking to Ahaz anymore. You, Ahaz, you don't want a sign? Then I'm going to give you all a sign. I'm going to give everyone a sign. Everyone listening to this, everyone reading this, everyone hearing this, everyone in the world. You don't want a sign? Fine. I'm going to give you all a sign because this is very important. I was going to do it through you. You don't want it? I'm going to give it to all of you. And so, therefore, the Lord himself will give you, that's you all, a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. So a son is going to be born to a virgin. That should get your attention because that's impossible. And his name is going to be God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. So he's with us. God is real. God is able to help. And God wants to help us. We live in so much fear that those things are not true. Really, all the things we struggle with and all the fears we have in life really can be boiled down to being afraid that those things aren't true. Because if we know those are true, that God is real, that, he, that he's able to help and that he wants to help, there's nothing we're to be afraid of. So all of our, we, we spend so much time in fear that those things are not true. But God wants us, as he said in the text, he wants us to stand firm in our faith to stand firm in our faith so that, that, that we won't be afraid. And so God wants to give us a sign to reassure us. He wants to give us a sign so we don't have to be afraid. He wants us to let us know. And sometimes we don't want the sign, but he's going to give it to us anyway. When, when all hope seems lost, when, when everything seems like, like it can't get any worse than this, a sign that, that he himself has come to save us, that, that he is the God who's near, uh, a son. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Now, that would have been incredible enough if, if the Son of God just became human and lived among us for a while and gave us his teachings. That would have been incredible. But he did more than that. He did more than that. He came to be with us. He came to be here with us. So we're asking the question this month, what child is this? What child is this? The God who is near. The purpose of the incarnation. Incarnation is fancy church word for God becoming a human being as he was born as a baby. Incarnation. So the, the purpose of the incarnation is so that we could have a relationship with him, so that we could have a relationship with God. So in Jesus, the, the almighty, unapproachable God becomes a human being who, who, who could be known and loved and understood and who can take fear away. Now, does that, does that, does that stun us the way that it should? That, that God became man here with us? Does that stun us the way it should? Because remember in the Old Testament, every time someone drew near to God, there was terror involved, right? There was fear involved. I mean, people died coming in the presence of God. People died touching the Ark of the Covenant. People died coming in the presence of God. Just imagine like if Moses were here today listening to the message of Christmas and, and reading these words from, from John, um, where those well-known words where it says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Remember Moses, like, like God's dwelling was up on that mountain with the thunder and the lightning. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son. Moses would cry out, I didn't even get to see God's full glory. Do, do you understand what this means? This means that, that through Jesus, through Jesus Christ, we can meet God. 
God dwells with us. We can meet God. You can know him personally without terror. This would have blown Moses' mind away. You can meet God without terror. What, 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 what child is this? Do, do you understand how amazing this is? How, how amazing this is that, that through him the God can be near? When God showed up as Jesus Christ, he didn't show up as a pillar of fire or a windstorm, but as a, as a baby. Can you think of anything more vulnerable than a baby? Babies can be picked up, held, hugged, kissed, completely vulnerable. So why did God come this time as a baby, but not as a storm? Because God came this time not to bring punishment, but to bear it. He came to pay for our penalty, to pay the penalty for our sin. He came to remove the barrier between us and God so that we could be together. Jesus is God with us. That's why we can keep calm and don't be afraid. Because we now have a perfect relationship with God, who is the Lord of all. That means we have nothing to be afraid of. Okay? You don't need to be afraid of, of rejection or failure. Because when you know how much God loves you, the God of all loves you, who cares what anyone else thinks? You don't need to, you don't need to fear the, the future. Because when you know that God is good and that he's in control of everything, you can trust him. You don't need to fear death. Because you know that you're going to be with the Lord forever. So friends, you and I, we have a sign. We have a sign that can always help us past our fears. All right? Ahaz. King Ahaz, are you afraid of those armies? The virgin will give birth to a son. God is with us. Emmanuel. Friends, are are you afraid of the, the debt you're in? The virgin gave birth to a son. God is with us. Are you afraid of all the anxieties and craziness that Christmas is about to bring? The virgin gave birth to a son. God is with us. Are you afraid of the things going on in the news when you turn that on? The virgin gave birth to a son. God is with us. Are you afraid of that big challenge looming over you in life, at home or at work? The virgin gave birth to a son. God is with us. Are you afraid of what the future might hold? The virgin gave birth to a son. God is with us. So don't refuse to look at that sign like Ahaz. And don't be like the guy with the letter from the IRS and and refuse to open up God's letter so that he can remind us of his good news. Go back to it again and again and again. Grab those Advent devotion books on your way out, one or both. Grab them and go back to the Word again and again and again every day. Every day go back to the Word because that's where God reminds us. Right here in his scriptures. That's where God gives us his love. It's right there in his word. So let's not listen to the voices of fear out there. Let's listen to the voice of God in the scriptures because that voice says, the virgin will give birth to a son. Friends, God is with us. So, open the letter. Open that letter. Don't leave it sitting there getting dusty. Open it up. We have such a great gift here. I mean, just think about it in his word. We have such a great gift here because here we know how everything's going to end. We're not like it's watching a movie where I, I, it's afraid, you know, I'm afraid, I don't know how it's going to end or, or reading a book. We know how the story ends. We know that everything's going to turn out right. We know that everything's going to turn out good. That's the gift we have here. So we're, we're afraid, we're worried. We can come back here and, oh, Christ is still on his throne. Or, oh, Romans 8.28 hasn't evaporated out of the Bible. It's still there. It's still there where God promises that everything is going to work out for our good. Or 
we see all of our problems and we go back here and we kind of like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yep, yep, I guess our problems have always been his possibilities. So the kidnapping of Joseph resulted in the preservation of his family. The persecution of Daniel led to his being placed in a position of godly influence that, that changed lives for millions. The, the, the predicament of Ahaz here with his fear led to God giving us all a sign that shows us and reminds us that he is near. Jesus, Jesus entered our world through a surprise pregnancy, and he redeemed our world through his unjust murder. What child is this? The God who is near. The God who is near. So let's open that letter and remember how he is near. I remember, um, I remember my dad when I was little. I remember my dad let me climb up in his lap and drive the car when I was really little. Yes, I know you would be arrested for that today. I get it. But this was South Dakota in like the early 80s, okay? So he would let me get up on his lap and literally put my hands on the wheel and drive the car, and we'd be heading down the road going pretty fast. And my hands would be on the wheel, and I'd be steering it. Now, was I afraid as a little kid? Was I afraid of driving into the ditch? Or maybe slamming into an embankment? Or flipping the car over? Nope. Because my dad's hands were on the wheel right next to mine. I wasn't afraid at all. Anyone can drive a car in the lap of a father. And anyone can navigate through life when they know that they are in their father's hands. When they know that their father is near. When they know that their God is near. So, when you're afraid, when you're afraid, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. What child is this? He's the God who is near. Let's pray. Lord, we know you're here with us. We know you're with us. That's what your name means. And yet, all of us here, we, 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 we run up against things. We, we, we meet challenges in life that, that tempt us to fear, tempt us to worry, tempt us to wonder where we're going or what we're doing or who you are, or if, even if you're there. So I ask you to, to bless us with your presence and, and remind us of it today, every day, so that we can go out in that world and, and be people who know that you're near and, and live with that kind of a confidence and so that others around us see that confidence and, and want part of it too so we can share you, the God who is near, with everyone we meet. So be with us and bless us and, and keep us calm and unafraid as we live life for you. In Jesus' name, amen.